Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the Interpret Free Library. My name is Vivian Fisher and I am Deputy Chief of the Pratt Library State Library Resource Center. This afternoon we have a great program for you. I am pleased to introduce today's guests, Jason Reynolds and Dee Watkins. But before I begin introductions, I would like to remind you that we have many great upcoming programs for the remainder of October and during the month of November. And in October, we're going to have, we're going to have Misty Copeland and we're going to have Jada Pinkett Smith here within the next couple of weeks. And in November, we are excited to be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the African American Department. So we have great programs for all age levels during that month. So please check out the Compass newsletter, the Pratt's website, and our program flyers. And it is our with great pleasure to have two people who are well known to the Pratt community, Jason Reynolds and Dee Watkins. Dee Watkins is this afternoon's moderator, and he is the New York Times bestselling and award-winning author of The B-Side, The Cook-Up, Where Tomorrow's Aren't Promise, We Speak for Ourselves, and Black Boys Smile in memoir and moments. He is also editor at large for Salon. He is featured in the HBO documentary, The Slow Hustle, and is a writer on We Own the City, an HBO miniseries. His work has been published in the New York Times, New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, Rolling Stone, and other publications. He is a college lecturer in the, at the University of Baltimore, and holds a master's degree in education from John Hopkins University and an MFA in creative art, creative writing from the University of Baltimore. And he has also won numerous awards for his works. Our feature guest, Jason Reynolds, is an author of novels and poetry for young audiences. He is a number one New York Times bestselling author of many award-winning books, including Look Both Ways, A Tale Told in Ten Blocks, all American Boys, Long Way Down, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, um, with Ibrahim Kendi, Stump Boy, In the Meantime, illustrated by Raul III, and Ain't Burned All the Bright, with artwork by Jason Griffin. He is the recipient of a Newbery Honor, the John Steptoe Award, the National Book Award, a Friends Honor, an NAACP Image Award, and multiple Coretta, Coretta Scott King honors. Reynolds, Reynolds was the 2022 National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, and he has appeared on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, The Daily Show with Trevor Noor, Late Night with Seth Meyers, CBS Sunday Morning, Good Morning America, CBS Morning, and various media outlets. He received his BA from the University of Maryland, and he is on the faculty at Leslie University for the Writing for Young People MFA program. He lives in Washington, DC. And we are excited to hear about his latest work, There Was a Party for Langston. And to quote Mr. Reynolds, which I love this quote, he says, here's what I do, not write boring books. And he wants to champion librarians, so he is our ambassador also. And I would be remiss if I didn't send a shout out to all the children's librarians from the Enoch Pratt Free Library. So please welcome Dee Watkins and Jason Reynolds back to the Pratt Library. I'm sure some of y'all are confused about why I just kissed the interpreter. So I should tell y'all before the tweets start. Uh, my best friend in the whole wide world who I've known since I was four years old, Aaron Holmes, who anybody who knows me knows him. This is mother. Didn't know she was going to be here, but <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know you. 
could have called me. You could have. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see so many of you. Um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk really quickly about why I wrote the book, where it came from. I'm going to show a very quick video from the brothers who illustrated this book because they can't be here. And I think it's really important that you all see their process and sort of what, because it is a little different. Um, and then me and D, Baltimore's, Baltimore's finest, right? <laughs> Child of child of Baltimore that everybody loved. I ain't never know nobody. Look, y'all love him as much as he loved y'all for sure. All right, we'll, we'll get into our conversation. Um, a couple years ago, maybe, well not a couple, maybe 15 years ago, I saw a photograph. I don't remember where I was, um, but I'd, I'd seen this photograph of Maya Angelou and Mary Baraka, two poets who were hugely impactful uh, when it came to my career and sort of the way I was brought up and how I was learning to write. And they're the ones who laid the groundwork for me. Uh, Mary and I were friends. Uh, Maya had been in her presence one time and it was so intense. Uh, we talk about that later. There's a photograph of the two of them dancing, which you'll see in a bit. And they're dancing at the library, at the Schomburg Library in Harlem, New York. Now, without any context, you don't know they're at the library. Uh, you don't know they're at the Schomburg, you don't know they're in Harlem, and furthermore, you don't know why all this is happening. And so after I did my research around this photograph that was shot by a man named Chester Higgins Jr., they were actually at the dedication, so the, the Schomburg was dedicating this particular space to Langston Hughes in the library. This is 1991. And not only were they dedicating the space to Langston Hughes, but buried under the floor, which these two luminaries are dancing, are the ashes of Langston Hughes. And so Maya Angelou and Amiri Baraka are dancing on the, on the ashes of their hero. And a lot of things struck me. Number one, what an incredible way to memorialize our greats. I think we're so used to crying and weeping, right? But what, an, what a fascinating idea to dance on the ashes, to dance on the life of the life, on the, on the lives that have made us. And two, that the party was in the library. And I think so often we see libraries as, as, as sacred institutions, because they are, but I just don't know many sacred institutions that don't have space for celebration. Uh, and so it started me thinking, like, I want to tell this story about Langston Hughes and about Baraka and about Maya Angelou, but I don't know if six-year-olds actually care, right? And so I needed to figure out how to use them as vehicles to actually talk about what the library might actually be for. That maybe if we can convince young people that the library is a place for, the, for their joy and their exuberance, for their jubilation, uh, if, it's a place for them to party, whether that be physically or mentally or emotionally, it's a place where they can be in communication with the millions, millions of ancestors around them, right? Whether they pick those books or not, those people, those voices are there, right, with them as they move through these spaces and as they sort of, uh, you know, spark their own curiosities and imaginations, right? And that's where the book comes from. So because the brothers aren't here, I'm gonna show you, I've never worked the clicker before because there's usually other people to do it, but they're not here, so here we go. Let's see if I get it right. They told me down means up, we'll see if it works. <laughs> but the brothers, the, the Pumphrey brothers, uh, you'll see that their process is actually, there's no, it's not, it looks like it's all painted or drawn uh, and it's drawn, but not in the way you think. They actually made this whole book by using, by making stamps and stamping the pages and creating uh, almost like, like prints of everything. You'll see it if this works, we'll see. Am I supposed to point it toward any particular place? Point it toward you?
así. I'll show y'all a quick, I'll show y'all two images. So there's an, one of the spreads. So for those of you who don't have the book, hopefully this will entice you to get the book. Uh, there's a spread that the brothers did. Another beautiful spread. You see all our, all our ancestors in the, in, the, in the shelves, in the stacks, some of our heroes looking out. And then I think the last one is the famous photograph. All right. All right. Thank you. Can we make some noise for Jason? Make some noise for Jason. <laughs> Story time, but I'll be quick. I just, I really, really, really felt like I have to tell the crowd, um, you already know how special Jason is. You already know that he is uh, arguably the most important living writer right now. <laughs> you, you know, you know this. You can look at this crowd and you know this. But you know, like, like when I when I barely when I barely knew Jason, right? I was um I was making some visits to some schools to a high school, um, Forest Park in in, in Baltimore, uh, Miss Miss Hall's class, and and I was having a long day. I was having a rough day, and I was a little tired. And I'm just, um, I'm standing in the front of the school and I, I didn't have an ID and they were like, who is this guy? And I'm like, I promise you, I don't want to hang around high schools like a creep. I'm legitimately here to do this, you know, a book talk. So a young woman, she recognized me and she was like, oh yeah, our class is reading his book. And um, she was like, I'll take him, you know, I'll take him to the group. And I'm like, you know, thank you so much. She validated me, kept school police out my back and all that. And as we walked, she said, you know, Jason Reynolds. And I'm like, yo, I know who Jason is, and I, I read his work, um, but I don't know him, know him, but I'm definitely a fan. And she was like, yeah, you know, my father died. He got killed. And I wrote Jason Reynolds a letter, and he responded by sending me every book he's ever written. Somebody said, praise God. That's God's work. He's using his word. He's transforming lives. Um, he's building the next generation of readers. And and which brings me to the first question, because I want to I, I want to get into that. I think um, I think one of Jason's talents, um, which, which which makes him so brilliant, is that if you read one of his novels, if you read this book, if you read any of his writing, he's literally speaking to everyone. Right scholars at the highest levels and people who are just really, you know, finding their way and beginning to feel comfortable with books. I think it's a Hawthorne quote that uh, goes, easy reading is damn hard writing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I would, I, would, I would like for you to, um, to, to, to talk about that, talk about that style and talk about craft and talk about how you was able to, to accomplish that. Yeah, thank you, brother. I appreciate it, man. Um, you know, there's a difference. I was talking to actually one of the brothers yesterday. We were down in Texas and we're having, having breakfast. And uh, we were talking about how simple and easy are diametrically opposed, right? Simple and easy as concepts are on, oppo on opposite ends of the, of the spectrum, but we typically equate the two or conflate their definitions, right? Can y'all hear that? Is that just me? Can I hear that feedback? Okay, you got me? All right, perfect, I think that's it. So simple and easy are actually vastly different things, but we talk about them as if they're exactly the same thing, right? And the truth of the matter is, is that something, if, if something is simple, uh, it's typically the opposite of easy, right? It's easy for you to experience it and really, really difficult for me to make it, right? My goal is, has always been the same since I started this is my 19th year, so since I started 19 years ago in this industry. And that is to honor the fact that young people can handle sophisticated art. Um, and that it's important that we make sophisticated art, books that they can grow with, right? Books that they can read over and over again and in every facet of their lives, every stage, the book changes as they change, right? Uh, and so like, I'm always thinking about layers. I think there's always a, there's a, there's a top line, right? There's a, a top line story. And then there are all sorts of layers underneath that top line that may not be illuminated until you, know, you read it at, if you read, Go, if you read Ghost at nine and you read it again at 14, it's a different book. 
completely different book because there are things in that book that you that you don't see until you get a little older. It's like Beloved, right? Ghost is not Beloved, by the way, but you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. But but you think about a book like Beloved. I read Beloved for the first time at 22 and didn't understand a single word. Read it again at 27 and maybe caught half. Read it again at 35 and was like, oh, I get why this is a masterpiece and can't wait to read it at 45 when maybe I've grown all the way into it, right? But that's the way, that's the way I think good literature works and I think young people deserve good literature, not just because um, I think they can handle it, but also because it's my job to build their palettes. I think you can't be mad at a, at a person who makes it to 25 and doesn't have a palette for anything complex when we haven't done our jobs to create complex art when they were young, right? And that's always the goal. My favorite Langston Hughes poem is English B. And I, I think it's my favorite poem because I just, I felt like that was my introduction into learning about the two Americas and the things that connect us, these small things that connect us that, um, that if we notice, um, you know, we would get along better potentially, right? Um, and, you know, and, and if I can like speak in a happy way. Um, I see your favorite Langston poems, uh, Mother to Son and the Negroes Speak Rivers. Can, can you talk about those poems? I mean, Mother to Son, first of all, uh, I'm like a wild mama's boy but like not in the enabling way, right? <laughs> or the Oedipal way, but in the healthy way, right? <laughs> Which is important to sort of make the distinction, right? Some mama's boys are terrorists, you know what I mean? I tell everybody all the time, don't trust no man because you feel like he love his mama, he gonna love you, you not his mama, right? Uh, <laughs> he has exceptionalized his mother, right? I, but, but I love my mother, my mom is one of my, you know, she's, she's uh, the greatest person I've ever known, right? Just the greatest human being I've ever known. And an example of sort of like what life can be if you allow it to evolve, if you allow yourself to change and grow even as you age. And so I have a lot of respect for her and a lot of love for her. We're very good friends, like we're, that's my ace. And so mother to son, I love it just because my mother has told me those stories, right? My mother has sort of sat me down and said, listen, and I've used that by the way, as a, as a, as a catalyst for uh, getting through tough times in my life, right? Every time I'm going through a hard time, every time I feel down on myself, every time I'm exhausted from travel or from, from doing this or from work or for whatever it is, I go to my mom's house and ask her to tell me a story. And the reason why is because when she tells me the stories of her hard times, I realize my hard times ain't so hard, right? Perspective is a valuable tool, right? Talk to your grandma. And you realize when grandma said, baby, we couldn't even get on the bus. You realize that you not being able to sort of cover gas is, is rough, but not that rough. Right. And, and so I think I think it's just about mother to son just reminds me of like what what the perspective of elders is and how valuable it is for us to continue to live the lives that we lead. And then Negro Speaks of Rivers. I just love that. I love that poem just because. The honest reason I love that poem is because it's very rare that black people are equated to nature. This is the truth behind it. I think that for whatever reason, it's very rare in art that black people are equated to nature. We, we oftentimes talk about like the water, right? There's always the water and we, we, we'll, we'll talk about that on a very surface level a lot of times. But he's talking about how we, how we are those things, how we're like those things, how we're enmeshed in that, right? Whereas we, we love to quote Bruce Lee, right? Bruce Lee, be like, be like water. Langston Hughes said that 50 years before, 30 years before, right? He's saying that, 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 that who we are is, is just like the river, right? And, and, that, and, and, and there's something about that that I think, one, is really fresh even today. Uh, and also that just makes me puff out my chest. And, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I am like the river, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel in lots of ways, whether that be, I, I'm, I'm, I am the thing that perhaps you feel comfortable enough to come and bathe in. And I am also the thing that can kill you, right? I am, I am all of those things. I, have, I, I can be a river that is, that is raging or a river that is calm. I can be something you can wade through or something you can drown in. And, and the truth of the matter is, all of us are, as he, as he so famously said, we have every right to be both ugly and beautiful because I am, I am but a human being. And I think that's what that poem does. 
you know, I'm, I'm laughing because Jason, he made me think of my grandma, right? And I, and I, you know, rest in peace. But I remember she was like, um, you know, she we had the peaches and cream oatmeal. This is like, you know, like the 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 80s when like like oatmeal started coming in like cinnamon swirl, sugar, peaches and cream. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, man, I don't want no peaches and cream oatmeal. And she was like, you know, I got it good. We we didn't even have oatmeal. We just had meal. We didn't even get the oats. We only got the meal. You get oats, meal, and pe and cream. All right, grandma, you right, you right, you yeah, right. But it's real. Right. My mother, my, right. my, my mother loves to talk about. It. She like, y'all kids, y'all y'all get to have meat every night. She was like, we had meat one night a week, uh. and it was a very slender piece that we had to share with my sisters. And I'm like. All right, you know what I mean, like. But also, it's like, all right, word up. Like things are actually getting better. I think it's disingenuous, and we'll move on. But I think it's disingenuous, and we have to be very careful. And when I say we, I'm speaking about older millennials specifically in this particular moment. I think we have a way, uh, a, a short-sighted, dismissive way of saying, mm. "Ain't nothing changed." Mm. And I'm like, man, you slapping all your folks in the face. Absolutely. Like you being wild disrespectful to be like, it's all still the same, man. We still ain't nothing changed since the 60s. Ain't nothing changed since the 20s. I'm like, bro, I don't, first of all, you wasn't it. Right. Right. <laughs> and second of all, and, and the people who sacrificed their lives, like my mama and your mama and your grandmama, like what a slap in the face. Things are not the same because you got peaches in your oatmeal now, don't you? Right. right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because I also feel like if we had, if more of us had that perspective, then we would be able to make the best out of the, the way things are now. But we're not, we're not doing that. Right. All this, I am not my ancestors. I am. Yeah, yeah. I hope to be. Right. Standing on their shoulders. And um, listen. So um, you, you mentioned, you mentioned um, Amir Baraka. The great Amir Baraka, yeah. the great Maya Angelou. Um, they're kind of like that second storyline in the book because you get to that famous photo yeah. talking about the dance. So um, I, I want you to talk about your experiences with them, and then I kind of have a, a really good follow-up for my creatives in the audience. Yo, so the first time I met Amir Baraka, I was 16 years old at the University of Maryland. He had come to give a lecture, and I couldn't believe it. I loved him already. I was, like, obsessed with him because... One, because I, it was the first time that I had read language that felt percussive. Language that sort of had, like it felt like a drum, right? His ability to use onomatopoeia, right? To, to, to turn sound into word was something that I had never seen before. Um, and it felt all like erratic and like, I was like, whatever this is, I love it. I don't understand a word he talking about, but I love whatever, whatever this is, I love it. And so I see, he comes to Maryland, I'm there, I'm in the back of the room and he is taking questions and he's at the last question and I raise my hand and he calls on me and he said, young man in the back of the room. And, and I asked the obligatory question that like so many young people have asked me and you at this point, which is what advice would you give a young, a young writer? Right. Which is a question that I respect, but like, I never thought, you know, you hear it, you're like, uh, right. But it's also like, of course, why not ask? I asked too, when I was that age. And he said to me, and he, yeah, you know, and he said to me what I what I now say to many, many young people and, and young writers. He said, kid, I'm going to tell you a story. He said, the myth is that Billy the Kid in the old Wild West was challenged. And the challenge was they bet him that he couldn't shoot a bullet through a grass blade. So Billy shows up the next day. He walks out into the town square. All the townspeople come out to see this and everyone's betting against him. And he pulls out his pistol, he pulls the trigger and shoots a bullet right through a grass blade. And everybody says, Billy, how did you do that without even aiming? And his response was, I'm always aiming. And he tells me this, he, he tells me this at 16 and it changed my life, right? It, the first thing it did was it helped me understand that the artist's first job is to pay attention. And the second thing is that the artist must always have their tools. But I keep a notebook. I keep now we have cell phones to do it, right? But I back then I kept a notebook and a pen and a pencil and whatever I needed just in case I caught it, just in case I heard someone say something interesting, just in case I read the newspaper and circled the story and rip it out or whatever it might be to always have my tools handy. Maya Angelou, I, I never got to talk to her. And I met a Mary, I was with a Mary many times after that. Wild stories that I'll save for another time. Um, <laughs> another time. But uh, Maya. She came to Georgetown Day School in D.C. My goddaughter was going to the school and had no interest of going to see Maya Angelou. That's how I know kids don't want, it don't really matter that much to a six-year-old, right? Got to add some extra stuff in there to make it interesting for them. But she's like, I don't want to see Maya Angelou. You want the ticket. 
I'm, I'm 19. And so, of course, I'm like, for free? It's the only time I ever seen in D.C. yellow curb, the, the yellow curb law lifted for the night in Georgetown. They lifted the yellow curb law, which means you could park on the yellow curb just because Maya Angelou was in town. And I get to the school, I'm sitting in the front row, and she comes out the back. And I, I first of all, she was six, she was probably six three. And she comes out the back and she stands at the, at the tip of the stage to be greeted, right? As we're clapping and standing for her. And I could feel it pushing against me. I could feel whatever that energy is pushing me back in the seat. And uh, I've never felt it before. And I'm not sure I've felt it since. Um, a person whose, whose weight, whose gravity, was that strong that you could feel, like we always talk about that, like you know how a person coming over, you could feel their presence, but like we won't really feel it. I'm talking like physically feeling it pressing against my chest, her standing in front of me, and I'll never forget that night. The rest of that story is I tried to like chase down her bus and figure out where she was staying. There's a whole other stuff. There's a whole other thing that happens after that. I found I found a phone number in the phone book because we had phone books back in the day. And, and so for all you parents who are, who are worried that your children's lives aren't private enough, remember, all of our phones and addresses was in the book delivered to everybody's houses. Uh, and I found Maya Angelou's office phone and would call her, call her office like every other day. Like, my name is Rose. I'm a, I think you would love my poetry. I just was like, you know, she never called back. But yes, that was my, my experience with you know, oh, Maya. Hello, Ma Maya, what, what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> the second part to that question, and then I'm going to get to these um, questions that you guys wrote down on these cards. I don't know if it was if these were all of them or if there were more, but uh, we're definitely gonna try to get through as many as possible is, and, and talk, the, the, so one of the beautiful things, and this is as like, a, obviously I'm, I'm an old guy, and, um, but reading this book with so much excitement because of that section of Maya and Amira coming together to dance, to celebrate Langston. And Jason's one of my best friends in the writing world. Um, him and Mitch are like my best friends in, in, in the writing world. And, I want you to talk about um, how important, or if it's important, for creators to have community amongst other creators because it is so competitive. It is so, you know, it's only giving one of them fellowships and I got to get it. Like it's yeah. it's, all, it's all of that stuff. It's yeah. all of that stuff going on. So can you can you can you speak to that? Yeah, you know, it's I, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, it's so important. You know, I think we love to romanticize or we like to talk about it very cavalierly, like the Harlem Renaissance or the Black Arts Movement, like these movements, right? And we're like, oh yeah, man, they were all together. They were doing this thing. And the truth is, is that like, there was competition there, but also they understood the weight of, of their communal efforts, right? It was like, look, we're gonna start a journal, right? Like the fire journal that was started, right? We're gonna figure out a way to, to create a groundswell with all of our work and some of us will go far, some of us will get to the midway point, but we all go and try to push each other to get there. Um, some of us will, you know, it, 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 their lives all ended up very differently, right? Zora, uh, because of a misogynist world, you know, unfortunately died a pauper and, you know, but then it was elevated later in life through Alice Walker. Langston, you know, uh, went on to be Langston and had his life. I mean, there are lots of different stories between all of them, um, but was never able to come out. Right? Lots of things were happening at that time. So the question around community, I think, I think for me, I don't know if I can do this without community. And the reason why is because it's just too lonely otherwise. We've chosen, if, you are, if you're a writer, now all, every art is different, right? But if, you, if you've chosen writing as your craft, you've chosen, if you don't have community, you have chosen a life of loneliness. Because unfortunately, the way that this work works, it requires solitude. It requires a lot of time in here, which is not always a good place to be, right? You, you basically are choosing to run through the landmine, the minefield, right? Every single day of your life. If you don't have somebody there to crack a joke with you and to let you know that you're not alone, this can get dark. I had lunch. Here comes the biggest name drop of, ever, of all time for all my librarians in the room. I had lunch two weeks ago with, you know, our, our patron saint, you know, Judy Bloom. What y'all eat? And we, and we, I know, right? And we, and, and there's a reason why I'm bringing her up. We're, we're having lunch. And I'm like, so look, you 85, hey, you know, you working? Like, what you, because that's what writers do, right? What you working on? Like, what's going on? And she's like, yeah, I can't. See, I'm 85 years old. I said, yeah, but your brain work, you sharp, right? And she's like, no, no, it's not that. It's that. I don't know if I have that much time to dedicate 
and like cut myself off from life. I'm 85. Do I have two and a half years to shut myself off from the world? She's like, I don't know if I have that in me anymore. And I'm like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense because that is what we do. If you don't have community, if you don't have, like, we want a group text all day talking trash, thankfully, because it's a way to, for us to remind ourselves that we're more than just this. We're more than just pen and pad. We're more than just, you know, competing for the same things, even though we're not actually competing, but like, you know, competing with other people that we know. We're more than than the names on the covers of books or, or the next byline that we can get or the next pitch that we need to do. Right at the end of the day, I'm a human being and I need to remind myself, this is what I do, not who I am, so that if it's ever gone, I don't have to be gone with it, right? And community is the thing that reminds you of, uh, of like the actual pulse of you, um, not just the brain of you, right? It's like, no, there's a pulse there, I'm a, I'm a person, you know? He's good at this, by the way. If you get you a friend like him, because all he know how to do is talk trash and, and laugh and crack jokes. <laughs> It don't matter how serious you are. We be trying to be serious, but he gonna always figure out a way to sort of break the ice, which I appreciate about him, you know what I mean? One more round of applause for Jason. I'm about to go to these. You imagine walking into a restaurant and seeing Jason Reynolds sitting across from Judy Bloom. You you literally just, you literally, like you're looking at uh, like uh, uh, America. Like that's that's wild. That's like they, you know they uh, you don't eat fried rice or what? <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I should have taken to the chicken spot. Right, <laughs> took it to the chicken spot. <laughs> Questions from the audience. I like this one. What was your favorite or least favorite writing assignment? Why? And how has that impacted your writing process now? Uh, writing assignment ever? Like when I was in school. Because when I was in school, my in English 101, the first assignment is like an essay, what do they call it, exigence or something like that. I don't even remember what that even means. But it was a, an essay about a fig, you had to pick a person and write an exigence essay, uh, if I'm saying that right. Exigency, I don't know. Uh, is ex exigent? Exigency? Exegesis? All right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is. <laughs> she would know. She know. You know what I'm saying? And so I failed it. Uh, so I, I so anyone who knows my story knows I failed English 101 twice. Right. And almost got kicked out of school for it. You probably didn't know that, but you know that now. You know what I mean? Um, but, uh, and the reason why is because I could not wrap my head around the fact that they wanted me to write an essay that was just informative. Like, just state the facts of this particular person's life. And that's it. Right. And so my essays are like, imagine a world where that was so and so, 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 so right? And the and teacher like, is no, like, nah, don't you know? imagine it. <laughs> right? and, uh, and I refused to, my mother was so angry, like, just do it like she's telling you to do it. Just do it like she's telling you. I'm like, I just, I just don't think she knows what she wants. I think that she, I think, I, I, I don't think I, she's telling me to write a boring essay, right? Like, I, and I just feel like she don't really want no boring essay, right? And my mother still, like, we laugh about it to this day, but that was the heart, and I did not do it right, and I failed the classes. I refused to do it, and, and then somebody gave me a quote after I failed it twice. I'm, like, feeling down on myself, and a friend of mine gave me a book, and on the cover of the book was a quote from somebody I don't remember, and it basically said, uh, most great writers fail English 101. And I was like, oh, okay, now I'm, I feel okay now. Mm -hmm. What age did you start poetry from Kayla Abrams? Uh, the, what age did I start poetry? I was 10 years old. I was 10 years old. The story, the very quick story goes, um, I fell in love. I was like eight, nine, seven, eight, nine. I fell in love with rap music. I have an older brother who's got like eight years on me. So he's right at the point where, you know, uh, NWA and Public Enemy and KRS-One and Slick Rick and salt and Pepper, all of this is happening. And he's a teenager. So he's blasting this. My mom is banging on the wall, right? All of that's happening. And I am like in love with everything, but he's my older brother who would not let me obviously listen or borrow anything that he has, right? So I go, I get this tape, Queen Latifah, Black Rain. I open it up and I read the liner notes and fall in love with poetry by reading liner notes of rappers. Um, and, and shortly after that moment, my grandmother dies and I need, and, and my mom is crying. I never heard my mom cry. For all of you who remembers the first time you hear your mother cry, something you'll never forget. It's the strangest sound in the world to fresh ears. It's the strangest experience because this is your giant, right? And now this is a moment of vulnerability that you're not quite used to yet. Um, and so I try to figure out a way to make her feel better. So I write down what I saw, what I've been reading, 
right? Queen Latifah and Slick Rick and all of them. And I write a few words down, make her feel better. And she printed it on the funeral program of my grandmother at my grandmother's funeral. And that was sort of the beginning. And once I realized that like, oh, people feel better because they read this thing, or at least they told me so at 10 years old, I realized that like, oh, okay, well, words have power, which means I have power because I have words. And that, that's all I needed. And after that, it became like an obsession. Like I need to figure out how to do this some more because really all we want to feel is, is useful. Everybody just wants to feel useful. And I, and I felt useful. Pay attention to these gems. He dropping them. Pick it up. Pick them up. Pick them up. You know. So many of us critique our parents, but we never critique ourselves. Like, if you read me, you know, I was a horrible child. Like, you know, like, but people are quick to say, uh, you know, oh, my mom didn't do this and my dad didn't do this. But like, you know, children are annoying too. <laughs> you guys are uh, winning child of the year. You know, so think think about that before you make that critique. Um, what is your favorite? What is the, What is your What is your favorite book that you have written, and why? My favorite book is probably a tie between the boy in the black suit. Uh, is yeah, th I thank y'all for those of you. It's funny because the two my two favorite books are the books that are the least read, but I actually think are the best written, which is the boy in the black, which is books two and three, the boy in the black suit, and as brave as you. I think those books are, they're all, and, and the reviews, when the, when the reviews came out, it was like, you know, Reynolds, Reynolds uh, returns with a, with a quiet novel. It's, or, or what's the other word? They, a, a novel with heart, right? And I really love, that's like, how, that's like the terms they use. But I really just think that they're, um, I hate that. I, I hate that. It's, it's ridiculous. That's what you, you say know? to the worst kid on the team. It's, it's like, worst. yo, Spunky has heart. He's got heart. Exactly. Spunky, he has heart. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. But I think, I think, I think that they are. Uh, I actually just think, that, quite frankly, they're the most beautiful tales. I think, I think, especially for. Funny enough, I think they're actually tales for adults, and I think that's why they're the least read in schools and with kids. I, I, don't, I don't think they're actually for kids. Um, I think that adults who have lost people in your lives, or in a black suit, hits different for you because you know it differently, right? Uh, and for the adults who were used to going down south for the summer and used to, right, which is not as, it's not as uh, prevalent these days, but for the adults who were used to going down south for the summer, who knows what that is, to go home, right, uh, you, Brave as You sort of hits different. And I think those two books are the, the ones for me. This is, um, this is, this is, a, is, is, is a good question. Um, I, I'm going to answer it first. It's for you, but I'm, I'm going to answer it first because I think, I think, I think I'm on to something. Here we go. What do you suggest to get high school males, especially black males, to read your work? And I'll, I'll answer it real quick before you answer it. Um, I've, you, I've literally gave away so many copies of Long Way Down, I kind of felt like I'm the reason Jason is successful. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> like uh, I'm really, like, I feel like, you know, just might just send me like a bottle of champagne or something. I but, got you. I got, but, I get it. I got it. You know but. Any chance or any opportunity I get to talk about literature, I love, 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 love to share books that are, 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 are genius, accessible, and they're really, really easy to get, and they're really, really, really easy to, to give away. So I, you know, so while we when we when we have those real conversations and we're talking about art, or we're talking about life, or we're talking about pain, right? Oh, you know what? There's this book, Long Way Down. This is just obviously Jason has 70 books, but you know, there's just one book long way down. And it's no, it's it's easier to give away than what? What's hard to give away? Like a mixtape? Like, <laughs> yo, it's so easy to get. But it's easy to give away than a pair of Jordans. Like kids take it and they read it and they finish it and they get confidence from it. But that's, that's yeah, my, that's, that's probably. Know. I mean, is anybody y'all know y'all know Long Way Down? Is anyone read Long Way Down? A few of y'all. So if you, I think, I think Long Way. If you have high school boys, there it is. Shout out to Long Way Down. If you have, if you have high school boys. Who are struggling, whether that be struggling in school, struggling with reading, struggling with stuff, right? Neighborhood stuff or all the things. Uh, for whatever reason, Long Way Down is is a book that has worked the majority of the time. Just because there are very few words on the page, it's a story that many young young men uh, can connect to in some way, shape, or form. Uh, it's a book that they can finish. A lot of people have said, like, this is the first book that my 17-year-old has ever finished. Um, and it was written with all of that in mind, right? Right. And so uh, and it's and it's entertaining, you know, so I think Long Way Down would probably be my suggestion as well. Complete this thought below. I find myself 
in an interesting period in my life because, oh, that's that's a that's a good one. That's a really good one. That's a really good I've, one. That's a good. That's a good. Pro- I'm gonna use that. Was whoever that is, I'm gonna steal that one. Come to the front. Come to the front. And claim that's your a prize. good one. I find myself <laughs> in, uh, in, in an interesting part of my. It's sort of an interesting part of my life because, um, because I turned forty in a few months, and 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 it, and that doesn't necessarily mean. It's 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 obviously like a milestone for so many of us because it's like the beginning of the middle, I suppose. But but I think the reason why it's interesting for me is because I'm trying to figure out at 40 what I want the next half of my life to look like and how much less of this I want. Not because I don't love this, but because it don't love me. Mm. And um, so there's some real honest conversations happening with my therapists and my mama and my friends and, you know, and my, like everybody and all of us are sort of having these discussions. It's like, Jay, you've been running the road for a long time. You There are 22 books in the world. There's a, there's some other things that I'm finishing up and working on. Um, you know, my mentor was the great Walter Dean Myers, who I, I'll always love him. For those of you who know who he is, you know, I don't get to be here if it's not for him. And when he was on his deathbed, the one thing he said was, man, what an interesting experience to have lived my dream and never lived my life. Wow. And wow. Yeah. And so that that's sort of where I am, right? I'm considering what that means for me, right? Like, all right, so you did the things. People are always, I, I love that people come to me like, man, somebody recently, we were in New York the other day, someone's like, you wrote all these books, school teacher. And she's like, you wrote all these books. My kids got all these books that you made. How are you doing it? And I was like, you know, what is impressive to you is devastation for me. And we don't consider it because you don't have to, right? It's not your role to consider what's happening in my life. But the truth is that in order to, it is not sustainable to make work at this pace, to make work at this level at this pace, and yet I have sustained it. So can you imagine what is happening to me mentally, emotionally, and physically? So now I'm at a point where I'm like, "Mm, let's figure out a new way to do this that's a little more healthy, Let's let's dial it back some. Let's create more space and avenues for younger voices to come up and take their and take their their rightful places at the table and have their moments. Right? Let's figure out what this looks like um, because I can't keep doing it this way. Good question. Good prompt. If you want thirty more books from Jason, make some noise. <laughs> <laughs> See, you'll get people like you. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah, all that you're talking, whatever. We need 30 more, you know? Yeah, you know, go to the islands, get a massage, come back to work. (laughs) (laughs) Ice your knees. If you hadn't been an author, this is actually, this question is right on time. If you hadn't been an author or a stylist, what profession would you be? Uh, Well, if you were to ask me this, and when I was getting started, I would have said, I don't know, because I didn't know. Um, I was 16, 17, 18. I had no idea what I would do. Uh, if you ask me this now, probably be a chef or make furniture, anything that doesn't require an office or a, or a suit or a, a clock it in or out, anything that I can't do, I'm just I'm just allergic to it, right? Even though, I, even though I always say that if it all went away, I would just go back to the clothing store, which is where I worked for ten years. I worked in a clothing store, and I wouldn't have to anymore because I could be a, be a professor or you know do something else, obviously, but. But it would have to be something where I wasn't, where it wasn't rigid. I just, I have a hard time with rigidity. Maybe I should just mature more, right? Grow up, right? But I, but I'm just like, I can't, I can't ask nobody to go to lunch, bro. Like I have a hard time being like, hey, I'm getting ready to take lunch. Because I'm like, you ain't the boss of me, but you are, (laughs) right? But you are the boss of me, right? (laughs) And so like, you know, and look, I know that that's coming from a very privileged place, right? I recognize that because the truth of the matter is my mother clocked in and clocked out for 40 years. Well, for 60 years, actually, uh, 55 years. And so I'm not, I'm I'm grateful for, for anybody. Look, this is how the world runs. But for me, that would be like hard for me, but it would probably be something like I'd be a chef or I'd be... I would rather work construction. I would rather, you know what I mean? I would rather be, be an architect where I can, anything that's like tactile and creative. It's the last thing you cooked. It's the last thing I cooked. 
Man, I think I did you like. You could have worn a chef around like six times. Nah, I'm like. Man, be like some type nah, of nah, flan, baby. Yo, it's crazy. Seared, so like the last thing I cooked. Fish or nah, I probably I think the last thing I cooked, which is before four tours, so that's like a week and a half ago. I had like fresh cut linguine clams. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like you sleeping, but okay, you really okay. Okay. You, 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 you should ask about me. I, I get busy in the kitchen. You know what I mean? I get I get busy in the kitchen. So I would I would definitely do that for sure. I heard you are writing an adult book. Is it fiction or nonfiction? Um, did you have to be in a different mindset to write for adults? All right. So I'm gonna answer this question. But I'm gonna add something more to it because I really want to talk about this other this YA book I got coming out that is either going to make everybody real mad or and uncomfortable or either be what it's supposed to be, either way. But the adult novel, it's, it's an adult fiction novel, it's a literary fiction novel, and it's kicking my butt and has been for the last eight years. So it'll be done. It was due three years ago. So we'll, it, <laughs> it, it, we'll see. We'll see when that happens. It'll, it, I'm working on it. Actually, I'm going home right after this to go to work and, uh, and uh, you know, put down a few words. But I, um, it's a process. It's a process, and it's hard because I've been working in a particular genre for so long um, that it's not actually different. It's that I can't seem to convince myself that it's not any different, right? So my editor is like, "Bro, you know how I tell stories? You've been telling stories for twenty years, right? Why are you like getting in your own way?" Um, and it's, the reality is because the pressure is so heavy, right? Everybody's watching, everybody's everybody wants to see, right? And I just I'm trying to push all that away to, to just do my thing. Um, so I'm getting there, and it's coming, and, and and you know you'll see it hopefully sometime late next year, early 25. But I got this YA book coming out. Did we talk about this. We did talk about it. It's uh it's coming out it's sometime next year, hopefully early next year. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to write a book. I think that like one of the biggest pieces that is missing in in the maturation of boys, uh, and in this particular case, in this particular context, which we have to be clear about is. It's heterosexual boys, um, and there's a reason why that's specific, is, is that nobody ever asks us how we feel or how we felt emotionally uh, and mentally before we lost our virginities. Nobody. Nobody considers, and the reason why is because nobody considers that we feel anything. No one has any consideration that, like, boys are having wild, like, it's, it's a lot happening. And for all the men in the room uh, who have experienced this, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and no one's ever asked you to talk about it. No one's ever asked you how you felt, or if you were nervous, or if you were anxious, or, or like what was actually happening to you. Everyone just assumes we're horn dogs. Everyone assumes that like we're just like these, 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 these animals. And the truth is, we all a bunch of scaredy cats who are like trying to figure this out, who are posturing. We've been given some bad advice. We've been all this stuff, right? Nobody wants to talk to us about it unless it's terrible advice that like perpetuates a certain sort of brand of masculinity, all this stuff. And I really want to, um, to chip away at it or at least to open up a, a real conversation about the fact that boys actually do have a whole lot of feelings and they got body body images, body image issues, all the things that everybody has, because they're human too. And because we haven't talked about it and we won't talk about it and we're afraid to talk about it, harm don't stop, right? And so I, I'm, I'm just working on it. And it, it's, uh, it, it's already done for all the teachers and librarians who are a little bit like, oh God, are we gonna be able to use it? There is no sex in the book. There's no sex in the book. There doesn't have to be, right? There's no sex in the book. One, also, I don't wanna write teenagers. I'm, that, that's gross for me too, right? But the, the story is moving backward. The story is moving backward, starting at the place where it's about to happen. So also kids can be like, oh, I'm in it, right? But then the story moves backward through this kid's, over the last two years of this kid's life, all the way back to, to when he meets this girl. Also, it's just a beautiful love story. Black kids can also just love each other and there not be no problems, no drama. It's like, you know, and that's it. Make some noise for the best to ever do it. Jason Reynolds. Oh, man, whatever. Thank y'all.